Amen. Thank you. You guys did it. Nothing will stress me out more than having a baby on stage. <laughs> so I don't know how uh, Casey does it. Uh, before we get going, can I get a volunteer, uh, somebody, not, not a brand new person, but somebody that's been around for a while, to come down here and join Mr. Lindsay at the front uh, so that he's not over here by himself? Because we all need friends, we all need community, and this is a man that we honor and that we love. Uh, so you won't distract me. Somebody just pop up and sit with him. Um, so this morning, we're starting a new series called The Power to Change. And this was largely inspired by my, uh, my wife when she kind of came to me and started talking about some of these things, especially when she started to talk about this thing that she was wanting to do on Sunday afternoons with the ladies. And so we kind of started digging into this. And, and that's where this came from. But before we get too far into it, has anyone uh, in January, actually, let's go back a few months because now it's March. So we're a few months into the year. Well, did anyone make any resolutions in January? Anybody? Yeah, a couple people. Yeah, I don't make them because if you don't make a resolution, you can't be disappointed in yourself. <laughs> so, yeah, but most people uh, uh, don't follow through their resolution. It, 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 on average, about two to three weeks into January, that resolution breaks, breaks and they, they stop doing that. Um, I think I've set a speed record on that where I've maybe broken resolutions the very next day. But, but also with that, as we're talking about change, you know, deeper than just a, a New Year's resolution, is there something about yourself that you wish that you could change? Is there something um, about yourself that you know that you need to change? Is there something about you that you have hoped in the past that you could change that you could do something different and you could change that thing about you. See, th th this message that we're talking about today, this is a message for all of us that know that we could change, we should change, and that we hope to change. It's for those of us that have something in our lives that we felt powerless to, that there's never been an opportunity or there's never been a way that we could figure out how to take this element in our life and actually change it. So I think that so many of us, we get stuck in this place where we feel powerless and that there's nothing in us, no ability in us, that we can actually change something. And so what we're going to do throughout this message, and, and I've even added little notes on the screen for you guys, is this series is going to be about building blocks. And, and this week we're going to lay a foundation of those blocks, and we're going to give you one thing to do when you go home today. And then next week we're going to build on top of it, and we're going to continue to do that for the next six weeks. Now, I, I, t I tend to not do long series that are six weeks long, but you know what? I know that there are things about me that I wish that I could change. And I know that, that at my age, almost you know, 40 years old in June, that you, I would think that I would have it figured out. But I don't have it figured out. You know, whether you're, you, whether you're 10 or 12 or 18 or whether you're pushing 80 or 90, there are things about us that we wish we could change. Or you look back on your life and you think, man, why could I not have changed that? You know, and so what ends up happening is we end up carrying this weight around with us. And this weight, it's like Casey with a baby on her back. But it's not a baby in, in your back. It's, instead, it's this this embarrassing thing, it's this regret, it's this guilt, it's this thing in us that we wish that we could change about ourselves. And we end up carrying it with us, and over time, it weighs us down, it weighs us down, and it weighs us down. Before we know it, we're barely able to move forward. And so, we're going to break that. So for everyone in here, I want you to think about, what is that thing about you that you just can't seem to change? Is it that you want to lose weight? Is it that you want to be better with your finances? Is it that you want to give up an addiction that you have? Is it that you want to become a kinder person? You want to be more patient with your kids? Is it that you don't want to be a slave to anger anymore? Is it that you want to stop looking at pornography? Or you want to stop relying on certain medications that you know you shouldn't be relying on? What, what, what is it about you? Is it that you need to accept forgiveness from somebody else or you need to forgive yourself? So there's all these things about us that we think, man, I wish that I could be different. I wish that I could change, but I just can't seem to do it. Or I get started on it, and then I end up dropping off. I end up not being able to follow through with it. So in, in order for us to do this, today we're going to lay a foundation, like I said. But first thing we have to do is we have to, 
to kind of start with this idea, and this is actually our first building block. And our first building block is this right here. It's that the real change is not behavior modification. It's spiritual transformation. So I don't expect you to agree with this or to understand this yet. We're going to continue to unpack this and we're going to continue to build on it. But real change is not behavior modification. When we think about changing, we think about we need to do something different with our behavior. I need to do something differently. Like when I think about, okay, how do I try and lose weight? My, my trainer is telling me that, that yes, you bulked, you, you ate you know, a lot and you gained muscle. And now it's time to go through a season of cutting where you need to lose some weight. And then now he's saying, hey, you were supposed to start that like six months ago. And so I'm finally at a point where I'm like, okay. I'm, I'm changing, I'm starting to lose a little bit of weight, but I kept relying on behavior modification. I kept relying on, hey, if I go into a petrol station, I, I'm just, how do I get in and out of that place without a candy bar? I would just tell myself, you're just going for a bag of ice. You're just ice. All you need is a bag of ice. Nothing else, bag of ice. Go in, close your eyes, first left, walk 10 steps, cooler on the left, grab the ice, turn around, get, you know, and get out of there. And it's like, you know, I black out and I wake up in my car and I've got a bag of jelly beans and a, a Snickers bar and a Coke Zero because behavior modification wasn't working for me. It just, it doesn't work for any of us. It, it sticks with us for a little while, but it's not a permanent thing. And so the first building block we're going to look at is that real change in you whether you're a Christian or you know Jesus or you've never been introduced to Jesus at all, I want to introduce you to this concept is that real change is not behavior modification. It's spiritual transformation. And now we're going to continue to look at this guy named Paul who, who wrote most of the New Testament. And we're going to look at some of the points that, that he talks about, kind of reinforce these ideas that we're going to look at today. They reinforce the building blocks. And Paul's on a journey that's very similar to us. Paul was in a place where he was killing Christians. He was persecuting the church. He was the worst of the worst. And then he had an experience that was not behavior modification. He had a spiritual transformation in his life and everything for him changed. Now what Paul did is he carried around the reality of what happened in order for him to make that change. And that's what he goes on to share with us. So if we have a hard time identifying with, with what's happening here, with the words, with the slides that I put up, with these building blocks that I explained, we can always look to Paul and look at what he's saying. And we can say, okay, I can put myself in those shoes because Paul was, was just like you. Has anyone in here, well, don't raise your hand. I was going to ask if anyone in here has murdered a Christian, but that, don't, don't, that's a bad... <laughs> I thought, oh, wait a minute. That could go really, really wrong. So, but, but Paul did. Paul was around that. So, so the point is, is that, is that we can all change. That Nothing disqualifies us from it. So let's get into what Paul says in Romans here. He's talking to the church in Romans. and He's talking about who he is. He's explaining himself. And so he's saying, oh, what a miserable person I am. He's, he's, he's really just recognizing his sinful place. Like, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Okay, before I go on there, that, that would be like us saying, man, I feel so bad because I can't make a change and lose weight that I'm just, I'm a miserable person. I walk around feeling miserable in my skin and my clothes. I just walk around wishing that I was better. I start to live this miserable life. And how am I ever going to get free from this that's just defeating me over and over and over again because I'm listening to lies or I'm believing lies about myself, but there's sin and death in the world. The world wants to keep you pressed down. The world doesn't want you to change. The world doesn't want you to be better unless somebody is selling a class on how to do it. And then obviously that pyramid scheme wants you to be better, but, that, but that's, that's not what the world wants for us. So Paul is saying, who's going to free me from this? And then he says, ah, here's the answer because he's lived it. Paul lived it. He was freed from this. And he says, the answer is Jesus Christ, our Lord. So you see how it is. Now, this is so important here. Paul says, in my mind, I really want to obey God's law. But because of my sinful nature, I'm a slave to sin. So there, there's a tension there that's happening in Paul. Okay, We can identify with that tension. You know, In our mind, we want to obey God and not look at pornography or not 
text that, that person of the opposite sex that we shouldn't be texting. In my mind, I, I don't want to do that. I want to obey God's law. But because of my sinful nature, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a slave to sin. So what that means is that all of us have this thing in us, a sinful nature. And what we're watching Benjamin right now is learning how to lie. We're not teaching Benjamin how to lie. It just comes. He just figures it out. He just learns how to do it. And that, that's just an example of that we, we have a sinful nature. It's just in us. That, that's, what, that's how that's, we were sort of born with that. And so Paul's saying, in my mind I want to do this, but I've got this tension. So what, what I want us to do is there's a couple different ways that we as Christians, so if you're not a Christ follower, if you don't know Jesus, then take an opportunity here to learn and get on the inside of the mind of the way that, that we as Christ followers think. And so there's a few different ways that we think about our relationship between us and God, and especially our relationship and how we see us and God and maybe how it could potentially affect our ability to change now or change in the future. And so I'm going to kind of unpack these for you. But the first one that we look at here is that, is that there's this concept, there's God and then there's me. Okay, so this is a thought process. So what happens here is God does something in your life, he leads you to him. You give your life to Jesus. You get baptized. You have this absolutely amazing experience. And then God leaves you alone. And so now it's up to you. You got to live right. You got to read your Bible every morning. You got to pray all the time. You've got to fast. You can't do the same sins that you used to do because if you do that, then God will leave you. God will no longer support you. God will no longer be for you. See, I used to worry so much in my life that, that God would pass over me, that God would have a plan for me. I, I even had terms for it. I had plan A and plan B. And I would say, I want God's plan A for my life. But will my sin, will the things I'm doing wrong cause God to pass over me? And then all of a sudden I've got God's plan B instead of God's plan A. And that really messed with me for a really, really long time. But that is a thought process of there's God and then there's me. I've got to do something to keep up with this. And this is so strong for us. Uh, a, a story about how strong this is in Casey and I's life or in my life, because Casey is more free from this, is that when Casey was working on, we were working on Casey's visa here and there's a whole big mess um, with home affairs and, and she was illegal for a long time and we're working with lawyers and we were just like, man, how do we get breakthrough in this? How do we get freedom in this? And we decided, okay, here's what we're gonna do. We're going to fast, but we can't fast. Because we're working with home affairs, this is not an overnight thing. This could be like a three-year deal, right? So our fasting, we can't fast for three years. We'll die. So what, then home affairs wins, and we refuse to let that happen. So we said, okay, we're going to fast. We're going to fast from milk, from sugar, from dairy products, from cheese. Basically, we looked at what we ate, and we took everything out, even sauces. We took everything out. So that at every meal, there would be some kind of tension that we would have to deal with that would remind us, it would kind of that, that would bring that sort of fasted mentality, that, fa that tension that reminds us to point to God. We did this for over a year. And, and in that time period, over a year, I would, I would walk through the line at Clicks and see the candy. I would walk into a petrol station and see the stuff on there and be tempted to, do, to, to eat stuff, to eat ice cream. We didn't have pizza for a year. We didn't, I, didn't have a, I didn't even have a cookie for an entire year. And the reason is, is because I thought, if I do this, I'm going to ruin what God has planned for Casey. Any moment, God could be ready to set Casey free, to set the visa free. But if I break this fast, God will say, oh, you didn't do it all the way. I'm passing over you. See, that's how strong that this is in us. It's in us so deeply. So now, the second way that we think, the second frame of, of thought that we often carry around is, is this. It's God, not me. Okay. So what this is, is almost the exact opposite. This is like, hey, you know, God is, is good. God is sovereign. God does everything. I don't have to do anything at all. In fact, I'm going to quit my job in Jesus' name, and then because I don't like it, and then God's just going to give me another job. It's going to be great. And you just sort of bounce around life saying, you know, God is sovereign. God is good. He'll take care of me. Yeah, I'll go spend this. I'll, sure, let's go buy the house. Let's go buy the car. 
Yeah, we can't afford it. We don't have the money, but you know what? God will provide. God will always provide. Your bank doesn't care if you believe that God will provide. Your bank wants to know that the money is there. But, but, but that's what this is. It's, it's the opposite. It's us taking, we have no responsibility. We have no accountability because God will sort all of it and he'll take care of all of it. Now, we get to the third one. The third one is the one that's correct. It's God through me. So what this means is that it's God and you. It, it's not about whether you do it right or you do it wrong. And it's also not about just putting all the relationship or all the expectations or all the, the to-dos or all the pressure on God to do it. Now, th this is about there being a relationship. There's a relationship between you and God. But what God wants to do, and we'll unpack this later as we go, is that God wants to do something through you that has an output somewhere else. See, God is interested in working with you and through you. God is not this thing that sits up in a cloud that watches you bounce through life and either gives you what you deserve or, or, or doesn't give it to you or he solves your problems or he doesn't. He doesn't sit up there and judge you and say, well, you messed up, so now you're going to not get the, you know, that's, that's not God. God is, is here. God wants to come out of here and he wants to come into here and he wants to work through us. And so let's look at Paul. We're going to, again, we're going to look at Paul because he, he exemplifies this so well because Paul went through this. So let's look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians. This verse brought me a lot of, uh, a lot of just comfort and uh, a lot of just encouragement. Paul says in verse 9, so Paul again, he's talking about how miserable he is. And he says, for I am the least worthy of the apostles. So of all the, at, at this point, if you don't know about Paul... Jesus has already come, he's died, there's the 12 disciples, and now there's all these, you know, there's different apostles that are spreading the, what they call the way. So Jesus, as, a, as kind of a relationship, they're spreading Jesus throughout the land. And Paul's saying, of all the apostles that are doing this, I am the least worthy of the apostles, and not fit to be even called an apostle. So Paul's being kind of hard on himself here. And he says, because I, at one time... I fiercely oppressed and I violently persecuted the church. So Paul sounds like he's in the camp of that it's, it's God then me. You know, okay, I have messed up. And so now God is not going to work or use me. So he kind of lays that out, that this is the way that kind of he feels. But something happens in his life and brings change to his life. He has a spiritual transformation. So let's look at verse 10. So this is what, what, what Paul encounters. But by the remarkable grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me was not without effect. In fact, I worked harder than all the apostles, though it was not I, but the grace of God, his unmerited favor and blessings which was with me. Paul's saying, I worked harder than all the other apostles. No one got whipped more than Paul. No one had more shipwrecks than Paul. No one had more snake bites than Paul. No one had more uh, times he was put in prison than Paul. No one had more persecution than Paul. Paul talks about times that he was starving, that he had hypothermia, that he was barely alive, that he needed God to sustain him. And no one else had been through everything that Paul had been through. You would think that Paul would have paid for the sins of his past. But Paul is saying, I didn't pay for the sins of my past. I was what I was. But because of God's grace, I am what I am. It's God's grace that does that for me. It's his unmerited grace. And so what this does is this introduces for us another building block, which is this wonderful word that Paul brings in here, and it's, it's grace. See, the... The, the grace that God gives us is what sets us free. The grace that God gives us is what breaks us out of the God, then me. It's what breaks us out of the God, not me. And it's what helps us to put into the God through me. Because the same grace that saves you is the same grace that changes you. So here we start talking about God through me. The grace that saved you, if you've given your life to Jesus, is the grace that changes you. That's the spiritual transformation. Behavioral modification, does, there's no grace in that. It's just sheer brute force and willpower. 
Spiritual transformation, that requires grace because God's going to work through us. So knowing this now, knowing that grace changes us, knowing that it's God through me, we have to ask the question, and I, this is where I like to get really practical, is that how do we know when something is actually a spiritually transformation thing? How do we know when something is spiritual transformation and not behavioral modification? So this is, and I, there's no deep underlying theme here. This is practical. How do you actually know? You, you know, like, I don't want you sitting at home and thinking, okay, I've got this change, but I don't know what to do here. I, if I do this, is it, is, am, am I subscribing to behavioral modification? Or do I need to read my Bible more? And all of a sudden that kicks me into the category of spiritual transformation. It, w- which one is it? So I want you to walk away with this very clear understanding of, of what it is. So how do we know when something is spiritual transformation? Okay, the first one, and this is a very easy one and obvious one, is, well, it's, it's spiritual. So there, there has to be something spiritual for it to be spiritual transformation. And then it goes on. We can go on and say spiritual transformation is powered by God's Spirit and not by your willpower. See, that, let that soak. Let that soak in. This, this week, I, I put my... My weightlifting straps, these things I wear on my hands so that I have better grip and I can pick up heavier things. And they were so bad that I, I couldn't even put them in my car. I would hang them on the antenna on my way to the gym. They smelled so bad. And I put those in, in hot water with some Omo and I let them soak. And then in the morning that water was like black. I poured it out and I soaked them again. It's like I, I want to let that thing soak in that water. And that, that's what I want you to do with this statement here. I want, you to, I want to let this soak on you. Spiritual transformation is powered by God's Spirit. It's God through me. It's not God outside of me or God wherever. It's God through me. It's God's Spirit and not your willpower. Now this should bring you a lot of freedom. Because our willpower will never be enough to change. It, it just will never be enough. We can will it. We can brute force it as much as we want, but it'll never be enough. And so when you're looking at how do I know if something is behavior modification or something is spiritual transformation, look at how much of this am I relying on Jesus or how much of this am I hoping is just my sheer willpower in order to do this. That fast that I was telling you guys about with with me and Casey, 100% willpower. And my willpower lasted a whole year. There was almost nothing spiritual in it for me. It was just fear. And that fear drove willpower in me. That was behavior modification. That wasn't God through me. That was me just hoping that, that I could do it good enough for God to bless it. So, the spiritual transformation is important. That we understand that it has nothing to do with our willpower. And so now, what I want you guys to understand is how do we actually do the spiritual part? So as I was preparing for this message, I thought, okay, well, but how do I actually do that part? So I I could go on with the message and just tell you all the good things, but I'm not super smart. I need the practical stuff. How do we actually do the spiritual part? If we're talking about spiritual transformation, does that mean that I've got to pray more? I've got to read my Bible more? I've got to do all these things more, 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 more? Or or what, what is it? I don't even know what to do. Well, it's easy. It starts with a why and a how. Jordan, go back one slide. Jordan's spoiling all the fun for you guys. It starts with a why and a how. So here, here's the Okay, here it is. You've decided that... Um, let me pick a safe one here. I don't want to go with murder again. But <laughs> you've decided that you want to be better with your finances this year. So you've decided that you want to get out of debt, that you want to be better with your finances. Now, your why could be, well, I want to get our finances better because I want to buy a house. I want to get our finances better because I'm tired of uh, uh, looking at my true caller on my phone all the time to find out who's actually calling me. Is it the bank? Is it a debt collector? You know, why do I want 
to be more financially stable? Why do I want to improve my finances? And then you think about the how, and it's like, okay, well, how? You stop spending money. Or uh, for some people, you know, you buy cryptocurrency and you go down, you know, these weird rabbit holes thinking, well, this is going to solve it. This is going to take care of it. You could also take, you know, it's an easy one, it's, you know, weight loss. Why do I want to lose weight? Well, because I'm tired of the way my genes fit on my body. These are my fat genes. My, you know, I want to get rid of the fat genes and fit into the normal person genes. So that, that, that's why I want to lose weight. And how? Well, I'm going to do it the way that I've seen it work for somebody else. See, everything that we want to change comes with a why and a how. So if you think about what's that thing in your life that you hope to change, that you haven't been able to change, well, you've got to identify it or else this message doesn't, it doesn't do anything for you. So I hope and I pray that you've got something in your mind that says, okay, it's this. If I could change anything about myself, it'd be this. And you've probably tried a million different whys and hows. Well, maybe this is my motivation. This is how I'm going to do it. Okay, that didn't work. All right, I'm going to do it for this reason, and this is how I'm going to do it, and then that doesn't work. So the why and the how will never work unless it has a spiritual component into it. So if we add a spiritual component to why, okay, this is something, this is what happens. When you add a spiritual component to why, you end up with God's purpose for you. So let's take the weight loss thing again. Easy example. And we could even do finances as well. Another super easy example. With weight loss, it could be, why do I want to lose weight? Well, because I want to fit in better jeans. I want to look better on the beach. I want that guy or that boy, that girl to turn their head and look at me when I walk by. You know, why? But if you take a spiritual element to it, and then all of a sudden you say, you know what? Why do I want to lose weight? Well, because my body is a temple of God. So my body doesn't belong to me. It belongs to God. My body is a temple. So because my body is a temple, I'm not going to put junk into my body. Instead, I'm going to take care of my body. I'm going to eat my vegetables. I'm going to eat my baked chicken. I'm going to eat my fish because my body is a temple. If you take your finances, you know, why do you want your finances to be better? Well, if you apply a spiritual principle to it, it could be, well, I want my finances to be stewarded well because I want to give God 10% back. I want to tithe. I want my finances to do well because I want to help those that are less fortunate than me. God told us, Jesus actually told us in the Bible, he said, to go and help the widows and the orphans. How do you help them if you have no money, if you're flat broke? You can't. So take whatever your why is for why you want to make the change, and you find a spiritual component to it. And when you find that spiritual component, it leads you to God's purpose for you. God's purpose for you is not to be poor and broke and dodging debt collectors. God's purpose for you is not to get diabetes and to die early because of the way that you treated your body. God's purpose for you is not to be addicted to the drugs that we get addicted to, not to whether it's fentanyl or heroin or whether it's tick or whether it's pot or alcohol or whatever it is, your sleeping medication. God's purpose for you is not to be addicted to that stuff. God's purpose for you is to live in freedom from that stuff. See, your why plus the spiritual part is God's purpose for you. So now if we take the how, because remember there's a why and a how for everything, and you add a spiritual component to the how, that is God's power through you. So the how will never be about your strength and your ability and your willpower. The how will always be about your reliance on God. And just like Paul said, through God's grace. See, grace is the how. And when we let God work through us, through us, it's God through me. And we add a spiritual component to the how. It's us recognizing, God, I need you. It's that simple. Surrender. God, I surrender to you. And then it's God's power through you. So God's purpose for you. Is, is, is this. i got another equation for you. So you've got God's purpose for you plus God's power through you equals spiritual transformation. See, this is another building block for us. See, it's easy. I mean, it's not easy. It's simple. Don't overcomplicate this. You have a change you want to make. 
You then have a why and a how. Take your normal why and how that never seems to work, add a spiritual component to the why, add a spiritual component to the how, and then you're left with purpose and power. And then you'll see spiritual transformation come in your life. That, that, that's when we see it. That's such an important um, building block for us. So it, it, it's hard to think that this is obtainable. Now, I, I know what it's like to feel like I'm never going to change. I'm never going to do it. And what this is doing is this is taking you completely out of it. And it's letting God do it. Because the spiritual transformation, it's not by uh, my might or by my power that I change, but it's through the power of God and through the might of God that there's change. See, again, God through me. Are you starting to pick up the pattern? God works through me. And this is another one of those important building blocks. And so now, for the rest of this message, I want to kind of give you guys some practical things that you can take home with you. And I was thinking about how do I make this even more practical? Because up to this point, we've determined that everyone has something they want to change in their life. And that change is not behavior modification, it's spiritual transformation. And that for it to be spiritual transformation, you need to take your why and your how, and you need to add a spiritual element to it. And then you've got God's purpose, you've got God's power, and then that brings spiritual transformation to you. And so now that you have this idea of, okay, that's how spiritual transformation works. Now I'm, I understand kind of what, what, we're, what we're talking about here when, okay, it's God through me. That should be starting to sink in and settle in. Now at this point, I don't expect you to have a major revelation where you walk out of here and you're like, done, figured it out. I hope that you take a step towards that. But, but this is deep-rooted stuff in us. And it's going to take some time for it to soak in. That's why these messages over the next few weeks are so important. Because they're always going to build on each other. That's why I even wrote building block on here for you. Because I want to visually trigger for you that we're building on something. But what I want to leave you with is something even more practical. Even more practical for you to do. Remember how, um, I don't know if you guys have ever seen these books in the store. It's this... Uh, it's this, it's this dummy series, How to Do Something for Dummies. Any of you guys have ever seen that? I, I picked out a few for you guys uh, because it's, you know, Cape Town and we're known for our wines and, and all of that stuff. It's, it's, you know, we've got a book called Wine for Dummies, you know, understanding grape varieties and wine styles. And, and I do know that there are people that understand this stuff that are extremely, extremely uh, smart. Uh, there's, there's Keith's son, Enzio. He... Went, he went to school. There's a word that I can't pronounce uh, that starts with an S. That's people that understand this stuff. Um, that's probably in the book. I should read it. But then I've got another one for you. Uh, it's Cooking Basics for Dummies. So we've got this for order outside. So if your spouse doesn't have this figured out, you know, that would also, that would be bad. There's Cooking Basics for Dummy. And then something that I wish that God had given me or that someone had given me when I moved to South Africa was Cricket for Dummies. <laughs> My first experience with Cricket was watching a, a, you know, people stand around in a white suit on a field thinking, is the game started yet? Is it started? Is it started? And then the next day, it was still on TV, and I was like, man, they're playing reruns, you know? Why are they playing such a boring game as reruns? And like six days later, it's reruns. And then I find out that, no, it's just it's like a seven-day test match. And then I'm thinking, do they go home? Do they eat? When do they go to the bathroom? I'm trying to figure out the logistics of, of cricket. So I, this would have been great if I'd had this, but, you know, I didn't. So what I want to do is I want to piggyback off, off of this, and I want to give you guys spiritual transformation for dummies. How and where to start, written by God. Okay, so, so this, is, this is for all of us here. I, I don't want to overcomplicate this. Guess what? God's not tricky. God, God is not tricky. God doesn't sit up in heaven and think, you almost got it, but you didn't. So you, sorry, you don't get access to this part of my love or this part of my freedom or this part of my grace. You just weren't quite smart enough to figure it out. That's not how God is. God makes this simple and easy for us. God's not tricky. And so the way that we 
start, the place that we start, and this is what I want you to do today as the most important building block that you can take away from this message today is to define your spiritual why. Now, this is going to take some soul searching. Now, it's easy for me to sit up here and to say, okay, you've got the why you want to change, you've got the how you want to change, and then obviously you add a spiritual element to the why, and that brings you to this great place of God's purpose. And yes, I, I use two super easy examples of finances and weight loss, but you know what? Our, our changes are far more complicated than that. They're far more complex than that. They're really, really deeply rooted in us. And this is going to take a little bit of time. This is going to have to simmer in you. You're going to have to put, this is not an instant pot meal. This is a slow cooker meal where you've got to let this soak and you've got to ask God, okay, help me find a spiritual element to the why. Now, for a lot of us, what that means is, hey, don't be afraid to call somebody. If you're stuck and you have no idea how to even add something spiritual to your why, because you don't even know what spiritual is, you think spiritual is lighting a candle or, or sitting, you know, cross-legged in your floor. You know, if you're stuck, ask somebody. And if you're somebody that understands this, go find somebody that's stuck and help them. Because we're not on this journey alone. We're on it together. But I want you to work on finding out your why. The spiritual part to your why. Now, the reason that this is so important is because if we don't find this, and remember, change is not about behavioral modification. Change is about spiritual transformation. And if we don't find out what our spiritual why is, if we don't assign a spiritual value to our why, then guess what? We revert right back to behavior. And so then, then we're stuck with this really kind of annoying, hard reality of this circle that so many of us get caught in. You, you know, you get out of it and you get back in it. You get out of it and you get back in it. And see, what happens is, is if you only change your behavior and you leave the heart alone, the behavior will come back. See, this is what happens when it's just behavior modification and there's no spiritual transformation. The spiritual transformation touches your heart. Why does it touch your heart? Because it's God through you. Do you think God could pass through you or pass through anything without leaving his mark or his imprint on you? Absolutely not. So when it's God through you, the heart can't be left alone because God's going to talk to your heart. He's going to change your heart. He's going to reveal to your heart what it is that you need. So if you only change your behavior and you leave the heart alone, the behavior is going to come back. And then when you cannot change your behavior, this is equally important. When you find that you're unable to change your behavior, that you're unable to, to make any change, you're unable to find that spiritual aspect or that heart aspect, and you keep dropping back into the same habit over and over and over again, then guess what? This is why. It's because you're trying to meet a need or bring relief to a hurt with something besides God's grace. You're, you're trying to meet that, that need with something besides God's grace. So anything outside of God's grace is going to pollute this. It's going to take away the spiritual part. It's going to make it just behavior modification. See, I want us to experience change that sets us free. But we keep, and I keep, this is, this is not just you guys, this is me. I often find myself trying to use something other than God's grace to bring change. And it just never works. The behavior always comes back. And if you're wondering, okay, why can't I get out of this cycle? Why can't I change? Why can't I do something differently? Well, I would just ask you to examine. Examine your heart. Examine your behavior. And think, am I relying on something other than God's grace? Am I relying on a friend, on a family member, on a program? Am I relying on accountability? These are all really good things. Am I relying on willpower? That's great to have strong willpower and discipline. But... Is that all that I'm relying on? Because if I'm trying to put that in the hole in my heart, then God's grace has no room. And if God's grace isn't in it, then I'm just going to revert back to the old behavior. So I, I want to finish with, again, we're going to look at Paul here. And this is, this is an encouraging verse. 
And I, I want you to leave really, really, really encouraged by what Paul says here in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. See, Paul is talking about, uh, in this moment, Paul is actually talking about where he went to God three times and he asked God to remove the thorn from his flesh. There's all kinds of speculation as to what this is. Um, it, you know, it could be a sin, it could be a habit, it could be a physical ailment. People have even said that maybe it was malaria. It, it could be, we don't really know. But Paul is asking God, please remove this from me. And God says, no. Paul says, God, please remove this from me. And God says, no. Paul says, please take this and lighten my load. And God continues to say no. And then finally, Paul says, each time that I ask for behavior modification, God instead said, my grace is all you need. See, Paul was trying to put something else in the box designed for God's grace and God just wouldn't let him do it. Lord, change my behavior. Fix this thing in me. God said, no, I've already got the solution for you. It's my grace because it's God through me. It's God through me. It's God's grace. And here Paul says that God said, my grace is all you need. See, that, that should be so comforting because that means it doesn't have anything to do with our ability. You don't have to be a strong enough Christ follower. You don't have to be a strong enough person. You don't even have to be all that disciplined. You just need to be surrendered to God's grace. Paul goes on here and he says, my power works best in weakness. Praise God that he said that. See, God is saying that I'm strong because you're weak. I'm so thankful I don't have to be strong. That takes so much pressure off of me. It's just, I can be weak and God can be even more powerful in my weakness. You know, that, that's called humility. It's called understanding that it's not about me, it's about God. And so now Paul even says, because that is such a great truth. So now I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. See, what, what this is, is this, this is like, you know, last week when I stood up here on stage and talked with you guys about you know, a time in my life that was deep and dark and that, that I wanted to even just commit suicide. It, it was, it's not me saying, look how great I am for what happened to me. It's saying, look how great God is because I was so weak that it was only God's grace that brought me through that. And so I can boast about my weakness because really what I'm doing when I boast about my weakness is I'm boasting about the goodness and the greatness of God. And that's what Paul's telling us here. And he ends so that the power of Christ can work through me. It's God through me. It's God through me. That's it. It's the grace, the grace of God that moves through us. So Jesus, he didn't come to, to make you better or to change you. Jesus came to rescue you. Jesus came to change you and to free you. He didn't come to make you better. He came to rescue you. And so today what I'd like to do before we pray and uh, before we sing a song, I, I just want to give an opportunity um, like we've been doing that if God has stirred up something in you uh, at whatever level you are in your journey. So maybe this morning God has simply just brought up something in your mind that you realize you can't bring change to. Or maybe you're a step further and God's brought up something in your mind you can't bring change to and he's revealed to you the why and the how that you've always chosen. Or if you're even a step further from that, God's brought up a change in your mind that you need to change. He's revealed to you the why and the how that you've always chosen. And now he's starting to speak to you about the spiritual side of it, which really is just accepting God's grace. So if you find yourselves in any of those categories then what I would ask for you to do is I would ask for you, if you don't do something different, then change never comes. So today I would ask you to do something different. And that's step out of your seat and to come down to our prayer partners and just, just let them pray with you. So there's something so powerful about stepping out. You just step out. And no one cares that you're stepping out. In fact, we celebrate that people step out and they ask for prayer. Now, if you find yourself still too afraid or, or, you know what, I just can't step out or I'm so unsettled in my heart, I don't actually know where I am, that, that's also okay. There's no condemnation here. It's okay if you find that you can't move. God is still for you. Remember, it's not God, then me. 
It's not God saying, well, if you don't step out of your chair, then you're not going to find healing from the change that you need. That's not it. But if you feel like God is wanting to work through you and you can share that with somebody down front, man, that's powerful. That's super powerful. And so if I could go ahead and get our, our prayer team to come down and they're going to tuck away into the corners here. And, and this team is people that, that I trust personally. They're amazing people. They pray for you. They care about you. Uh, they're there for you. There's no judgment in, in them. They're just there to walk this journey with you. We don't want you to walk anything alone. So I'm going to pray for us. And when I say amen, the band is going to start their song. And if you feel God moving in you, and you feel God stirring in you, then when we stand and sing, I just want you to move. Don't, don't, think, don't overthink it. Just get up and move and find somebody to pray with. So Heavenly Father, we thank you that you've given us the power to change. And I pray over uh, our ability to just understand the concept of grace. And I pray, Lord, that everybody in this room has heard something from you today, that you bring conviction to them because conviction draws us near you. You get rid of condemnation because condemnation drives us away from you. Lord, we want to change. We want to bring change to everyone in here. We want to bring change to our lives. Life is so precious and sweet, and you made us so individually unique, and you made us so wonderfully, and you gave a beautiful plan for us, and you sent your son to die for us, and yet we find ourselves just stuck. And so, Lord, I pray this morning that a bunch of people get unstuck. And you speak and you move. So Lord, I commit this congregation and all those listening online, I commit them to you in faith, knowing that you will always work and move because you are our God Almighty. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.